Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm in focus today, too. Congratulations. It's an innovation, yeah. That's, that's new. Yeah. We, uh, well, uh, listen, I've been uh, traveling all day. Just got off a train, so I'm woefully underinformed. You're going to have to be our guide to everything. Uh, for starters, there's an Iraqi election coming up, apparently. Right. There's an election tomorrow. Uh, there are two interesting issues, it seems to me. Uh, the issue of how well the Sunnis are going to do turns out to be not as interesting as I thought, because I didn't realize that unlike the previous election, this election, they've carved the country up into legislative districts. So the Sunni areas get their numbers of districts, whether they turn out or not. Uh, it obviously affects who gets elected, who turns out, but it's not like the more Sunnis turn out, the more representation they'll have. Really? Uh, That's an underplayed story. It is. Because I, I pay that, a little attention to these now things. Now, there are obviously transitional areas, so, you know, they get their 18 seats, with, you know, no matter what happens, and they might get many more, or I, I'm making up So we already numbers. know roughly what percentage of the legislature they'll have. No, it, it can, it, 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 the, the ranges, I, uh, the ranges uh, I see vary from 13 to maybe as high as 20, so... It makes but, a difference. but all of those are are less by about forty percent than the uh, the fraction of the population the Sunnis think they constitute, right? Yes, by about forty percentage points. Right, but the point the, the main point is that the the all this fuss about how Sunnis are showing up in mass. Well, if they don't show up in mass, they'll it's not going to deprive them of representation because they have their districts and you know their their Sunni districts. Uh, the, what does seem interesting is whether the Shiite parties. Uh, the Shiites will vote for more secular parties or continue to vote for the religious parties the way they did last time. Right. Uh, and, and that seems to me the key to the, the future of Iraq from my instant analysis. Uh, and if you read Iraq the Model, uh, a blogger who I go to when I want to hear the pro-Bush side of things. Uh, is that a pajamas he, media blog? He, he is a pajamas media blog, and they're actually making a big effort to, like, have correspondence in eight cities, and it actually could be a good thing. And, uh, and, he, and he's, a, he's a nice guy. He came on a tour of, of the United States, and I met him, and uh, he's a very sensible oh, so, fellow. Oh, okay. So it's an Iraqi but, blog. It's an Iraqi blog. He's, like, he's a dentist or something who's a Democrat. It's actually quite moving. I, you sort of tear up when you read it today. He, he rose to the occasion. But he's been predicting a secularization for a long time. On the other hand, if you read some of the news accounts, they suggest that in the crunch, people go back to their sects and will vote along religious lines. So that's, a, that's certainly one interesting issue. Uh, the second question I wanted to ask you is, uh, the troubling thing in the news accounts are all these Sunnis who say, of course we're going to vote. We, we, we screwed ourselves by not voting last time, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop the insurgency. It's a sort of a guns and ballots uh, strategy where the two aren't incompatible. And I was sort of hoping that there's some dynamic by which these insurgents are fooling themselves, these Sunnis are fooling themselves, that once they get involved in the electoral process, there's a dynamic that takes over that will get them more involved and get them to put down the gun. Well, I, I think in a way it's a hopeful sign that supporters of the insurgency are voting, because what you want ultimately is an attachment between the Sunni representation in the political process and the insurgency. That, that's, that's the only way you can have any kind of negotiated end. Uh, and the, the alternatives to, to a negotiated end don't seem to me all that wonderful. You know. You mean so you have something like Jerry Adams being the yeah. in, in 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 Ireland, where he's the political face, and you negotiate with him, and he no, sort that, of brings. No, that's right. I, I think initially you want some people in the legislature who speak highly of the insurgency. Um, that, uh, and uh, and people will feel that their voice is represented, and yes. in fact, the more strident they are, the more attached they'll feel to the. Yeah. To the politician. Yeah. I hope that there's that dynamic. But um, and wouldn't you, as the author of Non-Zero Predicting an Intellectable World Historical March Toward Democracy, don't you need some sort of mechanism like that, that sort of a whirlpool-like thing that draws people into democracies? You mean like that linkage between the insurgency and... Like, like the, the process by which these insurgents think that they're just voting for today and they'll go back to being rebels tomorrow. But in fact, they, two years from now, they'll they'll be. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's no always, longer be relevant. Yeah, whether whether it's self delusion on their part or or they they actually understand the long term picture, I think it's a good thing that you have this alignment of sympathies. 
Yeah, just very much the way you want to co-opt uh, Hamas into into entering the political process. I agree. We shouldn't be troubled by the fact that in, in the course of this they say some really nasty anti-American things. That's the more the better in a, in a certain sense. I mean, that, that's the way they're going to earn their, their credibility, right. uh, just as the right. Rocky leadership is ultimately going to have to dis America in order to maintain credibility in all the eyes it needs credibility in. Right. Um, yeah. So, so right. You, you saw this poll where uh, like 90 percent of Iraqis want a strong single leader and, and half of them want a mainly military leadership. Yes, I, blo I just blogged that. It, and the disturbing thing is that, they, that the trend is in that direction. Yeah, well, I kind of wish they had told us that before the invasion. It would have saved us a lot of trouble because they, they definitely had exactly that. Well, but 90 percent also say they want democracy. It's not clear what they mean by that. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, it, it is, I mean, seriously, all kidding aside, it is quite an indictment of Bush that he's created a situation, or the invasion has led to a situation in Iraq in which people do increasingly long for a Saddam-like leader, at least in the I, sense of I, an unflinching iron fist. Right, but they, they, they do that in Western democracies, too. Uh, well, it's a bad they, sign. They, 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 have, they have nothing as powerful as our president, for example. That, to them... Given what they have now, they want something more powerful than our president. <laughs> well, but, it's, but 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 they don't even have that. So it's, it's logical that faced with this parliament of squabbling parties and an ineffectual prime minister, they would say they want a strong leader. We would too. Uh, well, and, and, yeah, and the moreover, founding fathers moreover, of the United if, States if, decided if, if they a, wanted a strong leader. Moreover, if a non-trivial fraction of the population was getting killed each week, you'd want a strong leader. And that and it's a, and right. it's a terrible thing that we put them in that position. Bush himself apparently is now acknowledged. Uh, at least 30,000 Iraqi deaths. He didn't specify how many of those are civilian, uh, I, but the fact is close to 30,000 civilians have died. I don't think anybody before the war would have predicted that Iraq could be held together by a, a, you know, a, a chatting coalition of, of 100 different parties. It obviously requires some, some either, either, a, either a, a totally decentralized structure or a strong central leader. Uh, one of many things that the, the administration I mean, might have been a little more candid about you, before you, invading. You, you can be you can be for a strong leader just on accountability reasons. You have somebody to fire when things go bad. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say uh, maybe bell time. We've been seven minutes on Iraq now, and it's only okay, one country. Okay, okay. There's the whole world. Okay. Uh, so w w where are we going here? Uh, Brokeback Mountain. Brokeback Mountain. I I picking up from our debate of a couple of days ago. My contention is that. I, I accept the, the official PC gay position that sexual orientation is in the genes. I think my sexual orientation is in my genes. Why can't, by the same token, why can't a distaste for certain sexualities also be in the genes? Uh, it, it, uh, it could in principle, but when, whenever, uh, you know, whenever you posit that something is in the genes in a Darwinian sense, in the sense of being an adaptation, that is to say right. the inclination was preserved through natural selection, by virtue of being conducive to the perpetuation right. of your genes, you want to you want to come up with a plausible scenario. It's, so it's like, the easiest thing in the world to come up with a plausible scenario. If you're attracted to men, you're going to spend more time chasing after men, less time chasing after women, and you're going to have a harder time getting your genes into the next generation. Well, it's totally uh, a, well, a, not, a Darwinian saying, strategy not, to only be saying, interested in women. Mickey, I'm not saying not being attracted to men is not you know the, the more or less standard state of males in our species for for clear reasons but when you start talking about it like a revulsion i'm not talking about a deep-seated revulsion i'm talking about a visceral surface revulsion okay it would tend to steer you away from forming alliances that are not conducive to getting your genes into the next generation as homosexual alliances or not. You know, the, se the, sex with a rock is not a good way, I mean, not the country you rock, I mean a rock, <laughs> like a boulder, is, is, not, is not a good way to get your genes spread either, but I don't, I don't see any, I don't have feelings of revulsion when I look at a large rock. I mean, all I have to do is not feel lust when I look at it, and that's enough for Darwinian purposes. And you know, well, but, there's a sense in which uh, it, it, you, you can imagine uh, a, a, an inclination of being almost you know, uh, uh, at least championing homosexuality, even though you don't participate in it. I mean, I mean uh, on Darwinian grounds, you, you certainly wouldn't expect people to have a natural, males to have a natural tendency to discourage it or to, uh, you know, uh, persecute you, gays, because when you think about it, the more gay men, the better, the better for a heterosexual man. If you imagine yeah. like a hunter-gatherer community, you know, 100,000 years ago, there's 10 eligible men, 10 eligible women, 
If you're a heterosexual man and you see two two men disappear into the woods holding hands, you're thinking more power to them. That's wonderful. But that's a lot. That's a the same reason a lot of straights move to New York City. Right. So uh, so so you wouldn't. But, uh, you certainly wouldn't ex expect any any natural tendency to to discourage it or, or to to persecute. Or stigmatize homosexuals. Well, you that can, kind of entering the genetic. But as with many of these Darwinian stories, you can tell it one way and you can tell it another. Yeah, but I haven't heard but, a good story for out and out well, active but, revulsion. I've heard absolutely no good story for why homosexuality exists. No, and it's I've a little bit of a mystery, heard, and it's a complicated story. Well, you, so why is that a mystery? But yet you can see that it's in the genes, or do you? Do you, do you think homosexuality? Well, I take, is not I in take genes? people at their word. Uh, you know, uh, well, so there why, seems why to be you take some kind of behavioral genetics evidence, but you got to remember uh, a couple of things. One is that the, the environment we live in is so different from the environment that we evolved in that the fact that that certain genes that some people have leads to certain inclinations. In, in a modern upbringing, in a modern environment, does not mean that it would have led to that same inclination in the environment of our evolution, okay? So it's an example of how something could be, it's only one example of, of a dynamic by which something could be genetic and yet not be a biological adaptation. Not everything that's genetic is a Darwinian adaptation. And you think homosexuality might be such a thing? It could be, because the stories for how it would make Darwinian sense are not that compelling. There are theories that you can't dismiss, but, but I haven't heard one that just blows me away with its elegance. Have you heard of any society ever that didn't have homosexuality? I've heard anthropologists report to me that they spent you know a year with some very small-scale society, and they're sure there were no homosexuals there. I, but It's a hard, hard one to prove. Yeah. It's proving, uh, yeah, you got it. You, you'd have to have some pretty pervasive monitoring of behavior, even in a small scale society, to prove it, yeah. Um, I'm skeptical. I, I, but I, I mean, an another, another good example is uh, depression. Unipolar depression appears n not, not to be something you find much at all in these more traditional societies, whereas bipolar is. And yet, there's some genetic correlation with unipolar depression, but still, unipolar depression per se is a product of the modern environment, even though some people's genes happen to dispose them to it. So you think both homosexuality and homophobia might be modern expressions of genes that did not oh, express themselves that I'm not saying homophobia is in the genes at all. You're the one who's saying that. Right. So, but if, if it were, if, it, no, I agree with that, but if... If, if, if you're saying you trust me at my word, that it's... No, I'm, I'm saying I take gay people at their word or, you know, who, who say, why, look, this was, so deep, this, was, this felt so deep, so early, you know, although even that doesn't establish... I think I had a pretty early antipathy toward uh, having passes made at me by men. Well, that's a different matter. That's not the same as watching two men kiss. Although, look, I admit... I feel this is, I guess, politically incorrect. I feel slightly queasy when I see two men kiss, but yeah, well, that's all I mean. Right, but 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 I don't think it's in my genes, and I think I would be desensitized to it if I saw it more, and certainly if I had been brought up in an environment where you saw it more. I mean, it's just you could, be, des you could be desensitized to anything. Well, I mean, no, I, you know, no, I mean, some things are really hard to be. The the, the smell of decaying flesh. Uh, to not find that putrid would take some really <laughs> rigorous programming precisely because it's clear why there's an aversion to it, which is that if you get anywhere near it, you could, you could get fatally ill, right? It's got germs flying out of it and stuff. So th well, there are very deep-seated aversions for which there's a very clear reason, and it would not be that easy, although I'm sure it's doable. I think it turned out that bathhouse sex, which is sort of the unencumbered, the uh, un unregulated sex that, that happened when the gay community was liberated wasn't too hygienic either. Uh, witness the rapid proliferation of AIDS. Well, sure, but again, uh, so that's, so, that's, 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 again, that's something that, that, that was not that way in the environment of, of our evolution. So we, we didn't develop an adaptation that, that kept us away from that, whereas Don't you think the anal, you think flesh anal, would have been. Bob, I'm going to deploy the moose now, okay? The moose is uh, Pint Sulzberger's uh, symbol of the unaddressed important issue. Uh, it's sort of the elephant in the room, except it's a moose. And here it is. And and the moose is... So now we're going to get really candid and... We're going to get really candid. When, when was anal sex ever sanitary? In the environment of our evolution, there was no uh, antipathy to anal sex because somehow it was clean no then. What there was. I'm not even Give the one who said there was homosexuality in the environment. I just don't know, but... 
But there wasn't AIDS in human populations. But there are germs, I mean... Well, there's germs that can be transmitted, you know, heterosexual. There's germs that can be transmitted by shaking hands. People do it. I... Well... What I will say... I think, I, I think the moose is back to you in a corner. Here. What I will say is that I think maybe the, the uh, producers and marketers of Brokeback Mountain agree with you that a gay love story is not going to sell. Because I, I saw Heath Ledger on the Charlie Rose show. And Charlie Rose, you know, Heath Ledger's the, the lead actor. Charlie Rose right. says, what's this movie about? And he says, it's a story of forbidden love. Uh, and I'm thinking, man, would you care to elaborate on the kind of uh, forbidden love? And, and no, he wasn't. And, he, went on for, and he went on and on and on and didn't mention the fact that, that it was, uh, that it was a, about uh, gay men. Now, it could be that there is, I think there actually may be an, an earnest belief among the people involved in this movie that it is about universal love. I mean, later Heath Ledger said it's about two souls who fall in love who happened to be men. Now, first of all, at that point, he was acknowledging uh, obliquely that it's, that it's about uh, gay love. Um, and secondly, I mean, he, he said it with kind of sincerity, and, and Ang Lee, the director, had just been on, and he, he uh, and by the way, he seemed to me like a very winning kind of person and a very sincere uh, person, and I... I I, I just got the sense from this pair of interviews that there was this ideology that kind of pervaded the production of this movie and that they actually do think of it that way as a story of universal love, which is a defensible metaphysical position. Well, that's fine. And, they, they have, and, and, and it's, it's certainly the ideology that's pervading the spin because they're in, in danger of getting politicized, which is a historic box office death. Uh, if, if somebody feels like they, they have to, to be a good person, go see this movie, they tend not to go see it. I... It, the, the movie seemed pretty moving to me in terms of the plot outlines I read. The, the, the question is, uh, I just don't want to be guilt-tripped if, if it fails at the box office. I don't think it says that America is homophobic. And you know that if that column isn't already on Frank Rich's Save Get Key, it will be soon. But you think it does mean that America is homophobic, but that homophobia is natural. Isn't that your position? Uh it, it means that, that, that homosexual sex and watching homosexual sex isn't America's idea of a good time. It doesn't mean that, America's, that Americans think homosexuals are evil or should be deprived of civil rights or even shouldn't adopt children or get married. It just means they don't want to watch them going at it and have it thrown in their face. Yeah, well, uh, one thing I will say for sure is that for a movie that's, that's famous for its candor, it has a pretty discreet marketing campaign. Well, you had me pin there. I'm amazed you let me wriggle out. Okay, i got to ring the bell here. The moose is temporarily satisfied. What next? Uh, what next is torture, I think. Ah. Because uh, uh, there was an article by, the piece by Mike Kinsley picking up on the Charles Krauthammer versus Andrew Sullivan debate that everybody was talking about last week. If you remember, uh, Charles said, Torture was a monstrous evil, but yet, despite its being a monstrous evil, he wants to carve out two exceptions. Andrew Sullivan says, let's have a flat ban on torture, but while winking and accepting that it's going to be violated when push comes to shove in the famous ticking time bomb case where if you torture somebody, you stop a nuclear bomb from going off in a city. Uh, Kinsley weighs in and tries to take on the ticking time bomb case and doesn't even accept it as an exception. Uh, uh, I, I, I found his art. His, his article well written but unpersuasive. I don't see how you get around making an exception in the ticking time bomb case. And he's forthright against Andrew, saying, look, if there's an exception, we want to codify it. We don't want to pretend it's not there. We don't want to be hypocrites. Well, I think, um, I mean, first of all, one, one, one favor that almost everyone who's written about the Crowdhammer piece has done for Crowdhammer, I haven't read Andrew's piece, but everything else I've seen has failed to point out that Krauthammer says that you should torture someone to save a single life, a life of one soldier. You should torture That's someone. So he go, he establishes that in principle, you know, you have to buy the ticking time bomb scenario. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you torture somebody to save a million people? You say yes. And he says, ergo, you must torture someone to save one person. He There's absolutely even, no logic deployed in between those two He doesn't even say ergo. He just, he just slides into it as if it was a seamless web of logic. Right. 
And, um, it, you know, it, it's like, I just can't believe that's not getting more press. That, that, should, that should almost exclude him from the, from the realm of rational discourse. It's so nutty. I mean, it's so extreme. Do you know anyone else who's saying that? You should torture people? Well, there are, there are people who go way beyond Charles Scott Haber in terms of torturing people. So. What, to uh, save half a life? To save somebody from skinning their knee or something, you should torture somebody? How can you go beyond this a torturing somebody to save by, one life? A combatant held by, you know, an Israeli soldier held by the enemy and about to be killed, uh, he thought, you know, he thought he should be able to torture to, to find out his whereabouts. You could have an Israeli, there are some people who were tortured for, Random civilians who, who we don't know, you know, are in danger of being killed. You can think of a lot of uh, less severe well, I, examples. I, I, I haven't heard anybody it, be it, that it, explicit quantitatively and be more extreme than that. I, mean, the, I thought Instapundit's post about this was, was more, actually a little more interesting. He agrees with McCain. He's in favor of a, a ban on torture. Uh, but he he wants to be he thinks we have to be much more explicit, not leave our our interrogators in the dark as to which techniques are permissible, not have sort of an elastic clause, which I think is implicit in the, in McCain's proposal that it, it, you know the the more dangerous the situation, the more you can torture. Uh, he wants and so he quotes from some interrogators who want explicit guidelines like waterboarding, yes, no. I would be. I don't even see why they can't have explicit guidelines like we don't torture to save the life of a single soldier. It has to be in the thousands of lives saved, or something like that. Yeah. Some, some, some rule that won't perfectly cover all the cases, but that stops somewhere on the slippery slope. Uh, everybody's throwing around these law school adages. One of my favorites is, you know, Mississippi is a tough word to spell. You never know where to stop, but you got to stop somewhere. Uh, the purpose of the law is to stop somewhere. And if we had a law that said, look, if it's in the triple figures, we don't torture. If you're saving thousands of lives, uh, you know, then you can do X, Y, and Z. If it's a nuclear bomb, you can do you know, even more. And making that explicit would be useful. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, fa I'm in favor of explicitness, and I'm in favor of setting the threshold very high, like, like uh, near the actual ticking time bomb. Scenario where you're you're saving hundreds of thousands of lives or something, but you know there there was a, a piece of news a few days ago that that is bad news for torture advocates such as yourself. It was this uh, New York Times story um, about the fact that apparently one of the key pieces of misinformation that helped get us into a, or the Iraq War was a byproduct of torture. There was this Al Qaeda guy. This is before the Iraq War. We had sent him to Egypt uh, where he was to be interrogated. Um, and apparently he understood why it is America sends people to places like Egypt to be interrogated because it was out of fear of physical abuse that he came up with this fake story about there being a connection between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. And this became like a, a major bullet point on, on the, you know, the, well, the administration's PowerPoints for getting us into the Iraq war. Well, it's, it's, so, torture sometimes yields bad information. It also sometimes yields good information. It, it does, we, but, but, we but, only but found, let me finish. We only found out about one of the big Al Qaeda plots to blow up airliners over the Pacific because a guy in the Philippines was worried about being. We told him he was about to be tortured by Israelis, and he was so terrified that he started blabbing. So uh, that was so, good information. That information checked out. We convicted people uh, in in New York on the basis. So did of that, that actually prevent an airliner from being blown up? From being blown up? It told us about how Al Qaeda worked, and we convicted a bunch of terrorists on the basis well, let, of it. Let's say it did. We don't have all let, that let, much let, information. Let's stipulate that it did save a whole airliner. The case I'm talking about: torture led to us getting into a, a war that's killed 30,000 Iraqi civilians and created a complete mess in well, the Well, the line of causality is a little. I mean, Bush was determined to get into war, well, whether this guy But, but the main point I would make is that often, when when I think you argue for it, and, and other people do, the way they put it is uh, is look. You know, when they're stressing that the standard talking point of the anti-torture forces, i.e., torture never works, is wrong, it's kind of they kind of say, uh, "Look, it's got to work at least sometimes." So, on balance, it's like you know, it's got to have net utility. Well, no. I mean, if sometimes it produces worse than no information, actually catastrophic information, then on balance. It, it may produce, you know, negative effects. Now, it's conceivable you could be so discriminating in your use of it 
that, that you could that you could weed out the negative effects, but I don't know how Bob, easy that's going to be. All, all I'm saying is that the fact that sometimes it works and sometimes it probably does does not mean that you know that that, that it's like a net. Positive, aside it's, it, from the externalities, you know, it's I, I, people like me emphasize the negative externalities. What, what, what our reputation for a growing reputation for torture does to the, the in the in the world world opinion of us, and hence ultimately to our national security. And I'm just saying, it goes beyond those negative externalities in terms of the information produced. Torture may be a net negative. Bob, Bob it's it's not like uh, if this guy hadn't come forward with this bogus uh, story. Bush would have said, oh, well, let's leave Saddam Hussein alone. Uh, he well, did, not affect, know, but he, but he he did might, not affect look, whether we look, went to war. Me, second, he didn't Bob, be... second, let me finish, because you've talked for a long time. Second, Martha Raddatz was on ABC just this past weekend sp spout, spouting the torture never works line. Well, if, yeah, I wish people like you uh, would say more loudly that the torture never works line, which is a line I've seen again and again on, on, you know, on right-thinking talk shows, is, is wrong. The torture does sometimes work. Well, uh, just, uh, I mean, as far as whether this particular thing got us into Iraq, we'll never know. There, there is always a snowflake that causes the av avalanche, and this was a lot bigger than a snowflake. It was one of three or four basic talking points. And if you don't think it increased the chances that Bush could muster the political support uh, for invasion, I I'm kind of wondering why they made such a big deal out of it, and there, and there are several other talking points. I mean, I didn't say if this is a democracy, the things, I hope things like that matter. Um, and, Bush, and, and in any event, you know how you do the math on this. It is suppose in a given case something like that has only a five percent chance of making the difference, or a one percent chance? Well, then it's one percent times the thirty thousand people know who died. We, Still we don't more know than yet. Jetliner, I win. We don't know yet that the Iraq War was such a disaster. In fact, tomorrow it's going to look pretty good, I think. Oh, Mickey, uh, look, bring... you know this is another argument, and you 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 specifically waited till the end because you know I wouldn't have time. No, to I just think we don't know. To ritual I, don't, humiliation I just don't over. think we've had the short-term costs, and we haven't seen what happens in the long term yet. Oh, man. Mickey, the people who, who are against withdrawal, you know what they're saying? They're saying their line is Bush, Cheney, everyone. If we withdraw now, it will be the apocalypse. And you know what? That's not crazy. That's the situation they've got us in. Is, it, is at this point, if we misplay our hand a little, you could have a civil war in the Middle East that goes regional. It could be very much like the apocalypse. But That's the situation they've got us in. There's an appreciable chance of it happening. If you think at this point, yeah, there's a pretty good chance that this was a good idea. Um, I think we don't know what's going to happen to the democracy meme, meme in the long run. There are also people, including the Secretary of State, who said yesterday we're about to elect the freest and fairest government in the Middle East. And there are a lot of people who think that if, if we don't pull out, that very, very good things will flow from it, and I can't say that they're wrong, and you can't say that they're wrong either. They're wrong. <laughs> okay, well, uh, uh, we, resolve, we resolve that. Yeah, and that's 28 minutes, so we can't go on about that much longer. Okay, well, I guess that... For you. Do you have anything else you want to talk about, or...? Oh, I'm kind of tired after that last little shouting match. Go I don't know, there's a little China point. Okay, people like contention, I think. They like what? People like No, contention. we heard two things. You got that email from the guy who said, don't be... My friend Dale didn't like it. Don't be he... like Crossfire. There's too much of that. Agree but... on things. Agree on things. Well, we've agreed on some things. Uh, but go ahead. Bring up China. Maybe we'll agree on okay, it. Okay, just quickly, two things. First of all, last time around I said... Uh, the, China, the human rights lobby had exerted a, a malign influence on China policy and didn't elaborate. Given that that's one of the few things you can say that antagonizes both the Michael Moore left and the Richard Pearl right, I should ela elaborate a little. The, um, <clears throat> the, the point, I mean, first of all, it's kind of a hypothetical point because, in fact, the China lobby has not ultimately, I mean, the human rights lobby has not prevailed ultimately. Both Bush and Clinton have pursued a policy of economic engagement with China, but there were many in the human rights lobby who would have liked to see uh, an emphasis on human rights come at the expense of a policy of economic engagement. And the fact is that China's economic engagement with the U.S. and with the world has pulled tons of people, Chinese people, out of poverty, has kept a number of them from starving to death. Uh, same in India. It's been those are the two huge success stories uh, in, in poverty reduction as a result of globalization. And I just think. Uh, it's it's crazy to prefer getting two dissidents out of jail to saving you know half a million people from starving, leaving aside 
the things, the other policy objectives we have to surrender if we focus so exclusively on human rights, such as getting the Chinese to help us in North Korea and so on. So anyway, that was a calculus. What? Quickly, there's an interesting piece in the New York Times about, uh, it says, Beijing casts net of silence over protest. Uh, th this is about this, uh, this story um, where these, th this village uprising was put down for forcibly by police and villagers were killed. And what's interesting, it says, public kept in dark as censors prevail. Actually, you read the piece, the censors don't quite prevail. And, it, and, it, and it's interesting how hard it increasingly is for the Chinese government to keep things under wraps. First, they tried not to report the story at all in the media, but then it was reported overseas, outside of China, and then that got back into China. And the, the way it got out, I'm sure, is because all the technology, which I'm always emphasizing, is having liberating properties. Um, you know, the NGOs are, are tightly connected to, to people in China. All these stories get out. They all get back in because China is poor. So then the government said, okay, we'll print the story, but they minimized the number of deaths. They printed it only in one region, and then they, they kind of made it hard to get to foreign stories on the Internet. Okay, fine. And yet uh, there's, a, there's a list of pro, uh, a, a petition signed by prominent Chinese intellectuals circulating on the Internet right now. Chinese bloggers have, have written about the whole thing and complained about it. Um, and, you know, then, then the Chinese do censor the bloggers, but apparently they don't do it so fast that, that the blogs don't come to the attention of the New York I, Times report I, first. I, I agree. Some of the stories, though, implied that, like, these rioting peasants in this coastal town had, you know, NGOs on the other end of their cell phones. That seemed a little bit too direct. I guess it's possible. It's conceivable, but, but I, I don't think that's it. I, I think it's now so hard to keep information under, you know, confined that... It immediately gets out to the intellectual elite, and from there it gets to the NGOs. I mean, I just talked to somebody who came back from Saudi Arabia, and he said all the kids there have these cell phones with, uh, that do video, that they actually have better cell phones than we do, and they, they, they take videos of, of politically consequential things and then send them by Bluetooth to friends and so on. Um, it's really... You know, I, I do think it's just that we're, we're watching the demise of authoritarianism. Uh, maybe, maybe they're doing that to us. What, what do you mean? They're, they have blogging heads on their, on their cell phones in there. The, the Saudis are, never mind, the Saudis are sending Could be. our video to each other. Could be. That may be where our constituency is. I've been <laughs> looking for it. That must be why they don't show up on our servers. Yeah, that would explain that, the, that particular blank spot. The, the, okay. Uh, the vast hidden Saudi audience. Um, well, thank you for that. I agree with you. So that's what they want. They want us to agree. That's what they want. Everything's in harmony. Uh, so great. I'll see you soon. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm hitting stop now. There you go. See you. Okay. See you.